Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, we are uh, wrapping up the course this week, and we're very lucky, to, uh, just in time, to have one of the fathers of SDN join us, Nick McEwen. Uh, Nick uh, has actually been uh, very involved in, in networking research even, even before uh, the OpenFlow SDN era. Uh, previously, he worked uh, with Cisco. He helped design the GSR router. Uh, he joined uh, Stanford in 1995. Uh, since then, he's also founded a couple of other companies, um, uh, one of which was also bought by Cisco. Uh, in 2006, he started a clean slate networking program at, at Stanford, which um, eventually became the genesis of uh, OpenFlow and the SDN movement. Uh, and we are uh, really lucky to have him today uh, for a bit to, to talk to him about SDN. So thanks, Nick. Oh, hi, Nick. Great to see you. Good. So um, I wanted to start out, out by talk, uh, asking you uh, for some uh, your perspective on uh, SDN success. Um, certainly, uh, as as I guess uh, networking researchers, we, we both have had uh, had the experience of having great ideas and, and and struggling with with getting industry to to adopt those ideas. And that's certainly something that that researchers commonly face. And 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 in general, just adoption is is a tricky business, in particular. There are these catch 22s where vendors don't tend to do anything unless you know customers ask for them. But customers need to first know why those features are useful in the first place, and that can be hard to determine if if hardware doesn't support those those uses. So um, I was just wondering, you know, OpenFlow has just been been a tremendous success story in this case, but in in, in general, just the SDN uptake as well. You know, um, how did you kind of manage to break that catch 22? I mean, what what was it that that sort of allowed vendors to start picking this up and, and sort of break that log jam? So I think there's two, um, it's a great question. I think there's, uh, there's sort of two aspects to, uh, to, to the question. One is, what, what can we do as researchers in general to increase the transfer of technology or rather to improve the practice of networking? And the second one, you know, what were the things, what, how did the planets align in this particular case to help make it happen? So I'll answer those in reverse order, starting with the sort of the specifics of SDN and, and OpenFlow. And, uh, you know, I think to some extent that, um, you know, it, while it would be, uh, it, it would be great to give uh, enormous credit to the, uh, the seminal work of Martin Casado, who really came up with and invented the, the, the concept of SDN. In many ways, it was an idea waiting to happen. And, that, you know, there'd been many pieces of work that, that led to that thinking, including work that you were involved with and um, the, the 4D work and, uh, and many other pieces that sort of preceded it. But um, there, was, there was this really pressing need for a change in the way that networking is done, the practice of networking. And it really came from a from a technical, um, a, a, I'm sorry, it really came from a business need pushed by the people that run big networks. And that is, they were trying to build big networks for which they want to add more capabilities, more services, they want to make them more reliable. Uh, they have enormous experience at running and operating networks, yet the only tools that they had at their disposal were the individual boxes built for them by vendors. And those boxes were closed, proprietary, um, and you know, frankly built on technology that is way, way behind the leading ed edge technology used in, say, computer systems. And so many of the practices were uh, were falling well behind, the products were falling behind, and they didn't have the flexibility and programmability. Basically, if you wanted to configure a network in the in the non-SDN sense, you got to log in, configure it using a, a CLI, and you got to do this individually for every box in the network. And about the most advanced form of control was people writing scripts to download configurations into into routers. Now, if you think about what you do in a pro in a, in a computer system, when you have needs for an application, you program uh, you, you program the system to do what you need. There was no concept of this in, in networking. And um, this inflexibility and this sort of very rudimentary way of configuring networks, um, I think it was really showing its age. So one thing was the observation that people who own and operate networks needed a programmatic interface. They needed a way to program the behavior of networks in the way that they wanted. I think the second thing was um, the the benefits of, of uh, networking equipment vendors from building their own hardware were beginning to go away. 
and um, there was a uh, just like in the computer systems of 25 to 30 years ago with the rise of the microprocessor it meant that there was a separation between those who built microprocessors companies like Intel and AMD from those who build boxes for build, build computers like uh, HP and Dell and IBM and so that separation led to independent paths for innovation and uh, the networking industry has actually been going through that transformation way before SDN came along with companies like Broadcom and Marvell building third-party switching silicon um, that could be used for anyone to build a piece of networking equipment. And you know, one of the biggest investments that you need when building a new piece of networking equipment is building the chips, building the hardware. It's 10 or 15 million dollars of investment, probably more than that, to build, uh, build a new chip. And so it used to be just uh, only accessible to those who, uh, who had the very, very deep pockets. Now, pretty much anybody can build their own box. And once you build the box, you need to add the software. And now, suddenly, it becomes a software problem rather than a hardware investment problem. So this, this was coming along. And the, the networking equipment vendors were kind of struggling to keep ahead because they didn't really want this to happen because it kind of uh, they were fearing they would kind of commoditize their, their, their business. And so one of the things that they were doing was adding more and more stuff unnecessary stuff down into the hardware. It's making the hardware more bloated. It was making the boxes, frankly, consume too much power, have way too many features in the hardware, blurring the separation between the, the, the control plane and the data plane inside the box. Basically, the systems were getting more and more badly engineered over time. And I think customers began to realize people that manage and, and operate networks just experienced systems that were clearly way too expensive, way too complex, not nearly robust enough, and consume way too much power. And so that coupled with the inflexibility of lack of programming environment, it was kind of ca causing this kind of creaking industry that was uh, getting further and further behind where it needed to be. And on the other side, you know, it's a bit of a cliche to say, but you know, as society now, we depend so much on networks. This wasn't a toy anymore. This is something that we desperately need to work well and to keep improving. And you look back, the internet infrastructure really hasn't changed very much architecturally in the last uh, last 20 or uh, 20 or 30 years and um, you know it was really showing its age it needed a way for new ideas to come into networking and by providing a programmatic interface that provided the means for innovation to take place in the infrastructure and that's how we got interested um, um, at the university and I think that's how you got interested too was this feeling that if the internet infrastructure is going to improve, then you need a way to program its behavior to improve its behavior. So really this was the sort of the main, the main, the main genesis. So as soon as people started talking about a programmatic way to control networks, it was pretty amazing how uh, quickly a lot of um, equipment vendors, network operators, people that run and operate networks, system administrators, start to pick up on the idea and say, hey, this is cool. So in some ways, the transfer of the idea started by appealing to, naturally appealing to the frustration that people that people had with the way that networks are today. And um, you know, gradually over time, that frustration turned into, OK, what should we do about it? Um, the the separation of the control plane from the data plane that we now know as the you know the, the defining characteristic of SDN, as that started to happen, we needed a, pro, a a way to control the hardware. That's where OpenFlow came along, and start people started putting pressure on the equipment vendors and say, I want that in my network. And uh, so after a little bit of encouragement with the vendors to say. Don't worry, it's not too difficult. Just work with us. We'll try and figure out a way to define this. Mm -hmm. it really, the rest of it took care of itself. Um, you know, I think we'd all like to feel that we, we can take a lot of credit for it, but really, it was just this sort of pressing need that uh, gave this, this this strong pressure. That's getting back to the other aspect of the question, which is how was networking researchers or system researchers in general? You know, how do we encourage the the transfer of our ideas to industry to try and improve the, the practice. You know, I think that we were in some ways lucky in this case because there was a sort of an aligning of the, the planets just at the right time. In general, it's really quite challenging. And you know, for myself, the reason that I do networking research and system research is, you know, it's because it's intellectually interesting, but because you know I want to improve the practice, and it's the thing I think about in the shower in the morning, and I wake up thinking about. And that's the thing that gets me excited: is 
how do we take networking, the internet, and make it better? And I think we all feel the same way. It's part of what motivates us. And sometimes in academia, the the relationship between academia and industry is seen as a bit, a bit dirty. Um, but we work in a vocational field. Engineering is a discipline which is all about the practice. We're merely trying to help improve that practice, either by ideas that are intellectual ideas that have a long time frame, they could have a short time frame. But it's really fun, and I find it really exciting to think about how to transfer those ideas and actually improve the practice. And one thing that I've learned that was very relevant to the whole SDN story is the most interesting ideas are the ones that when you first take them to industry to talk about them, they usually hate them. They usually hate the idea. They're the most, uh, they're the most interesting ones. For a long time, I worked in the, the, the design of switches and routers, which was um, really about how you change the insides of a box. And um, uh, the, the ideas were, what we decided early on was, if the ideas had immediate had immediate use and application to, to industry, then we should start working on them. In fact, I had a deal with my PhD students that if uh, we went and talked about uh, these ideas to folks in industry in the first few months that we were working on them, if they thought it was a really, really good idea, then we'd immediately cancel the project. <laughs> and, and, and the reason for that was, if it was so pressing a need for them, they should be working on it. They had more resources, more people. They had a bottom line to worry about. They could do a much better job than we could. So we'd say, you can have all the IP. You can have all the ideas. We don't care. You just take it and run with it. That's great. Do whatever you want. Go knock them dead. And, uh, but the really interesting ones are the ones that when you go and talk to people who are in, you know, in the practice, that they kind of, their first reaction is to go, huh? You really? Is, is, that doesn't sound like a very good idea to me. Or, uh, you know, what, what, what are you talking about? That's, that's a kind of an indication that, oh, maybe you're onto something. Of course, it may be that the idea is really stupid. But um, the ones that are really, really the knockout ideas are the ones where the first reaction is, that's a really stupid idea. And then you look to see if they're getting red in the face. They're getting really, really <laughs> red in the face. Then you know you're touching a raw nerve, like, oh, this is a part of the industry they're trying to keep closed or keep, keep to, them, to, to themselves. And this is the SDN story in our case, which is... Um, uh, when when Martine had been been working on the SDN ideas, in particular ethane, um, uh, I was there. We went with uh, with Scott Schenker and we went and gave a talk to a couple of companies. One of them was was Cisco, but as it happened, and uh, <clears throat> explaining the basic idea. And there were forty or fifty people in the room that got increasingly angry and cross and red and frustrated and said, "This will never work. This is a stupid idea. This can't possibly happen. You can't possibly have a." You know, a centralized point of administration of policy. You can't have the separation of the control plane from the data plane. It will never work. And uh, we went out into the parking lot. We looked at each other and said, we must be onto something. Uh, <laughs> exactly the thing that told us that, that a company like Nasira needed to exist. And in some ways, that was the genesis of the creation of the, uh, of the company. Um, actually, yeah, you mentioned Nasira, um, and uh, actually one of the questions I had was actually about uh, that. It actually came from, from a PhD student uh, who said basically that uh, Nasira was uh, a great inspiration to them. It, it, it showed how meaningful research can translate to, to both impact and, you know, also fortune in that case. But, um, but in general, as you said, we're, we're, we're very interested in impact. And, and so as, as a research advisor as well to, to, um, to Martine, for example, how, how did you... Uh, support Nasira, and you know, how how would you advise a student to to strike a balance between entrepreneurial instincts and, and academic research? And is is it even possible? Um, uh, so I think the, uh, the the first thing is um, if if you're in academia, be in academia as a researcher or a professor or whatever, because you love research. Absolutely, and you've got to love the the intellectually exciting ideas. And if you don't love the intellectually inter exciting ideas. You don't want to be in research. It'll be a totally frustrating experience. So people who are just pure entrepreneurs that want to go and start companies, don't do a PhD. Don't be in, uh, don't be in academia. You want to go off and start the companies, and there's plenty of opportunities to, to, to do that. There's nothing wrong with that either. Um, but you know, for, for those of us that made a career in, in uh, do a PhD and make a career in, in, in research, I think you have to ask the question of, what is the best way to see your ideas used in practice, if that matters to you? It's not not 
not a big motivator for everybody, but if that matters to you, then then what is the best way to do it? And our own experience has been that um, in every case where we've ended up starting a company, and I think it's about four that we ended up starting, it was not because we set out to start a company. That was never the first motivation. In fact, in every single case, we tried to give the ideas away first. There was no intellectual property, there was no patents, nothing. We just went and said to people, hey, we've been working on this for a while. We think this would be a really good thing. This would be a really good idea. Why don't you have it? Why don't you take it? Here are some proofs, some ideas, some papers. Why don't you go and, and, and do it? And on every single occasion, it was meant with this, met with this kind of blank look that, uh, that you know, we don't know what to do with this. And some, some skepticism saying, oh, well, if this comes from academia, it's probably, you know, it's done by ivory, uh, ivory tower academics. They don't know what they're talking about. And um, we found that it was pretty much impossible to give these ideas away. So in each case, after trying to get other people to adopt them, We've, we realized that we needed to be able to go and demonstrate. And I don't just mean demonstrate in the lab or demonstrate with a prototype at a, at a university. We really needed to go and, um, and, and go through the, the rigor of, of trying to commercialize it. And uh, that obviously is much more than just the technical aspect. It's convincing yourself that there really is an application, there really is a need for the, for the technology. And that can sometimes take six months, it can sometimes take five years. Uh, to really, really flesh out what the what the business uh, is here. So, my, the way I've encouraged uh, PhD students is, don't try and do this as part of the PhD. I really don't think it belongs as part of. It. It's a really big distraction to do it as part of the PhD. Do it after the PhD. Right. See if you can make it dovetail onto the end of the PhD if that's what you want to do. Um, Come up with the ideas, make sure they're intellectually interesting, make sure that you understand and believe that they have value to others. Go and talk to others. Don't be too put off if they don't if they don't get the ideas to start with. And then really if if you can see a path to transferring of technology via starting a company, then okay, then 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 go do it. But for, for people who just try and rush into doing it and see that as the end, and it, so that, that hardly ever works, particularly if you do it in the middle of the studies because it can be very, very time-consuming and a really big distraction. So I think you know a clean separation by doing one after the other can work. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, it seems like otherwise you're bound to do, do uh, a mediocre job at both. Uh, at best. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So personally, I, I really don't like it when uh, students are working full time while trying to do a PhD. I think that uh, having two bosses is no good for anyone. Um, Absolutely. Um, question about the the sort of um, industry adoption. I mean, we were talking a little bit more about uh, about that earlier, uh, but just in terms of what the current state is, um, just in terms of. Uh, what what are vendors doing right now in terms of SDN? I mean, certainly the the ONF is very active. We we can talk a little bit more about that. But in terms of um, vendors right now, do you, do you see a race to support the latest standard of OpenFlow? Do you do you see that people are going in a lot of different directions, trying to do you know custom add-ons and you know or or spinning their own thing and calling it SDN? Uh, um, or, um, what do you what do you see going on there? And actually, a related question to that is, you know, of course there are standardization efforts, but um, given the trends towards standardization, of course, uh, the vendors want to differentiate. And what do you see as the biggest opportunities for for differentiation in terms of you know the features or different domains where SDN may be deployed or or performance or what's what's happening there? Yeah, I mean, if you if you read the uh, the Popular press at the moment, you would think that the everyone and their everyone and their dog would, had uh, was producing an SDN, a software-defined networking product, and uh, pretty much everything that has a a little bit of software in it in the networking space has been uh, relabeled as SDN just because. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I recently saw a talk <laughs> where uh, where some vendor said something about uh, their latest SDN protocol being BGP. And I was uh, yeah. <laughs> And you know, when it comes down to it, it's worth remembering that that you know, SDN is a mechanism uh, that can be used to solve some networking problems. But you know, there are many ways to solve those networking problems. It's just one particular sort of uh, technique or, or, or approach. And basically, you know, it's SDN is the physical separation of the control plane from the forwarding plane in in a network. Uh, that's it. 
there isn't really anything else. And uh, all the things that we think of as the benefits of STN follow from that. You know, sort of fall out as a, as, a, as a consequence. So one test to ask when you're looking at these things that are called SDN um, as a way of sort of testing their market, marketing hype is say, is there a physical separation of the control plane from the data plane? Um, and is it being used to the advantage of the system as a whole? If so, then okay, it's probably uh, probably fair to call it SDN. And you know, at least half of the things that are being called SDN today clearly are not. But to get back to your, to your original question, um, there, there are clearly lots of people trying to figure out what is the best way to either create commercial products that are sort of SDN products, and a lot of people are doing that. There's lots of companies um, that, uh, whether they're members of you know ONF or part of the Open Daylight uh, Consortium and you know various various activities like that, you'll see them sort of popping up. And I think you know it's a, a wide scale, widespread, very honest effort to try and figure out what the right products are. There's clearly a lot of development going on at uh, all the traditional networking companies, they all have large programs and large projects of building SDN products. Um, <clears throat> whether they are, you know, SDN that happens to have OpenFlow in the middle or not, you know, that, that's clearly uh, just one uh, one choice. Uh, there's, there's there's all sorts of all sorts of efforts, and I think you know you'll you'll see it being applied to clearly it's already being applied to the data center to the interdata center WAN. There's lots of efforts to put it into mobile networks, cellular networks, backhaul networks, um, and uh, you'll start to see it put into the public WAN. I think over the next few years, uh, campus networks, enterprise networks starting to be. Uh, you know, products being developed, being developed there. But you know, it's still in the fairly early stages. The technology is only five or six years old, and so I think you know, I'd say that we're still in a uh, stage of learning about where it can be applied, how it can be applied, and um, you know, what the right interfaces are. You know, when it comes to the OpenFlow interface, um, if you're going to separate the, the control plane from the forwarding plane, you need some way to control the forwarding plane. Um, doesn't have to be OpenFlow. It could be almost anything that gives you. It could be a full CPU x86 instruction set that you that you use yeah. you know, to control it. It's it's convenient when you're a control plane writer or programmer to if most or all of the switches have the same interface uh, can be can be programmed through the same interface to make it vendor agnostic. Uh, that's just really a convenience. So OpenFlow provides that convenience to the software writers to provide a sort of a common, almost like an instruction set for forwarding. You know, when it comes down to it, OpenFlow is just a sequence of match plus action uh, primitives, uh, just reflecting the fact that we talk about flows as a, as a collective term for packets. The flow could be TCP connection, it could be a prefix, it could be all the packets going to China. Um, you know, it's just a convenient that we've always that we've always used. So it's a kind of a convenient paradigm, and pretty much all networking switches and routers, when they see a packet, they match on bits in the headers. They figure out an action they want to perform, and then they forward it. So really, OpenFlow is just kind of a reflection of what these boxes did anyway. It's 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 just a, a convenient and almost brain dead um, uh, reflection of what people have been doing for a long time, just in a sort of a slightly more abstracted way. So it's always OpenFlow came, I think, as a natural consequence. There could easily be a better version of it, a completely alternative version of it that gives you that same expressibility, and um, and that that I think we'll see various various flavors emerge. But I think the reason that people are sort of coming together around OpenFlow in in particular is just it's convenient to get together around one. I mean, I think we could all look at IPv4. You got to start say, somewhere. Yeah, yeah. IPv4 and say it wasn't perfect, but it was pretty damn good, and so it was good enough, and so people gathered around it and standardized it and, and, and used it. And um, really, the only reason there needs to be an open flow standard is because people build hardware. If it was all software, then if all the switching was done in software, you don't really need a standard a standard protocol. You could just Define that interface as needed um, when you were when you're sort of instantiating the the network. Um, <clears throat> it's convenient if people are going to invest tens or hundreds of millions of dollars in producing hardware. They want to know what interface they need to put on it so that people will use it and buy it. And uh, so that's why most of the effort is around standardizing it on behalf of the hardware switch hardware switch vendors. 
pretty much all the hardware switch vendors have got some kind of development activity. Most of it is focused around uh, I think it's OpenFold 1.3, which is the sort of the, the most recent of the, the standards. Um, and there's sort of conformance testing and bake-offs that go on, uh, as you would expect for sort of interoperability testing of those those products. And uh, so there's quite a lot of activity going on in that space. Again, like for SDN as a whole, it's kind of early days still. I think a lot of people are trying to figure out how do they, um, you know, what are the right features to put into that product? They, first of all, they have to put OpenFlow in there, but do they then use the extensibility kind of capabilities of OpenFlow to add in their own special secret source, extra priorities of uh, priority classes and um, encryption in the forwarding plane and you know all sorts of all sorts of stuff like that. So. Um, uh, people do that, and um, it provides a means for them to differentiate, which is great. And so I think that they'll uh, that we'll see more and more equipment vendors do that. I do think when we look, you know, we'll look back in in fifteen or twenty years, and my guess is, my prediction is that pretty much every kind of network that we use today, data centers, WANs, home networks, you know, everything will be. SEN, in the sense that it will have a separated data control plane from the forwarding plane, um, it will probably mostly use something that looks a little bit like OpenFlow to control the forwarding forwarding plane. But really, the, the critical thing, the thing that will change the network is the fact that it's the SDN piece. Um, and in some ways, OpenFlow is a tactical way to help that happen. Right, yeah, actually, um, that's, that raises another good, good point, which is uh, that, that you yourself have actually uh, done some recent work on Designing hardware that I guess would be, uh, you know, in some ways considered an expansion of the of the current OpenFlow uh, capabilities and with this uh, with this custom OpenFlow chip, um, and we actually we talked a little bit about the chip in the in the course. I, I gave an overview of of, of its architecture. Um, I was um, I was sort of curious there. I mean, it's 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 uh, it, you know it's sort of built on the on the observation that you mentioned that basically everything is is sort of simple match action or or some some co combination of matching and actions. Um, I was wondering um, if you um, consider that chip, for example, are are we done then uh, with the hardware? Can, can we can we can we let the hardware go and then we just think about you know the the control plane that sits on top, or do, uh, do you think we need um, you know an integration with other types of hardware like uh, FPGAs or software that processes traffic at a richer uh, you know, richer set of matches and actions and so forth. Oh, good, good question. So, you know, of course, we're never done. But um, the to sort of put that into perspective, that particular chip architecture. Um, so that came about from a collaboration that we did with uh, with Texas Instruments (TI) uh, starting a couple of years ago, and it came about by asking the question not not so much how could we improve OpenFlow, but in the light of SDN. If you want programmatic control over the forwarding plane, what was uh, what could what could you put into the the chips, the switching chips that was really low cost, really easy, really low power, didn't take up too much area, um, that would give you the flexibility that the control plane would want, and then asking the question, well, how much does it cost in terms of increased area or increased power? So we really wanted to understand that, and um, we're lucky enough to to. I mean, one of the sort of surprising stories of SDN is, um, as, as I'm, sh I'm sure you, uh, everyone is already familiar, you know, SDN uh, was made possible not really because uh, of a, a better understanding of networking. It was the coming together of software thinking and software processes and a software mindset and distributed systems to solve networking problems. Right, it was the, the 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 bringing of lots and lots of people from the software community and the distributed systems community into solving networking problems, and something similar is happening, I think, or will happen in the in the hardware, which is networking switching chips in the past have been de designed and built in a very fixed function way. They're basically a pipeline internally. This is the the sort of the common switching ASICs that start by doing sort of layer two Ethernet processing, then layer three processing, and then layer four processing. There's this sort of fixed, uh, fixed, very hard to change pipeline. And um, it sort of makes sense because almost any environment in which it operates, it's going to be Ethernet and IP, and maybe it's used as a firewall, and maybe it does MPLS, and maybe it does a little, uh, but it's, it's sort of this fixed fix function device. SDN is all about having 
control, programmatic control of the of the network as a whole, including programmatic control of the forwarding plane. And if you want the processing to be done in a different way, for example, you want the header bits to be used in a different way, you don't want to have the application to worry about it. You just want that to be taken care of and dis dis decided in the field if need be. Uh, it, you know, it's a little bit how memory management is done. You don't want to worry about where the particular bits are in memory. You just want that to be taken care of at a lower layer. So if you want that flexibility, then you can't have this fixed function pipeline. Then those two things don't get together, you go, go together. You need a little bit more flexibility in what bits get processed in what step of the pipeline. So the question then is, well, do you just throw everything out and say, well, you should just use software instead, right? Just use a general purpose CPU. Right. You could. could. Mm -hmm. um, and in some applications where the bandwidth is low enough, for example, my you know Wi-Fi router at home, then it's perfectly fine to use a, a general purpose processor. But for about 20 years now, there's been about a two of magnitude difference in the speed custom switching silicon from general purpose CPUs at processing packets. It's a very specific function, matching on headers, doing actions. And so it's unlikely that a CPU is going to have the same capacity to process packets in the plumbing layer, sort of this, this plumbing of packets. Um, and uh, so it's worth thinking about what should that switching ASIC be so that it gives us more flexibility but doesn't become so slow and high power as a, um, as a regular CPU. And you, know, you may be familiar with network processors and NPUs. They were sort of very popular about 10 years ago. And really, they didn't, I don't think they approached the problem the right way at all. All they simply said was, well, probably the best way to do it is just to throw a whole load of CPUs onto a silicon, uh, onto silicon, you know, a small number of CPUs, and then throw packets at it, and then you just program it. Um, and uh, it didn't really think about the problem at hand, which was that all of these devices, they just do a sequence of match plus actions. So this, this, uh, this chip design, we were lucky to have involved uh, in the project a couple of people who have a lot of experience in designing uh, custom CPUs and, and DSP chips, where really it's all about the layout of a pipeline. You start with a pipeline and then say, given that I've laid out the pipeline of the processing elements, you know, what else do I need and how do I insert the processing that I need into that pipeline? And the thing that we found was you need very little. You put in a, a sequence of steps, you know, a few steps um, in, in the pipeline, and then you make it possible to match on any bits that you want, either exact matches for using hashing or to a TCAM-like matches at each stage, and then have little processes, which are very cheap this day. You can have tens of thousands of them on a chip. Uh, little processes that will just perform the actions. They're just there to perform the actions. And then describe a set of, um, of primitive actions from which you can build interesting... Uh, ways to process packets. And the important thing is to make that whole that whole pipeline independent of the protocols that we use today and independent of the ordering. In other words, don't make it so that it's L2 followed by L3 followed by L4. It's bit manipulation followed by bit manipulation followed by bit manipulation, which all gets defined after the fact when it's in the field by the way that the control plane chooses to use, use it. So, when I look at that pipeline now and say, yeah, really, that's all that a switch or a router does, you know, yes, you don't really need anything else. People will find ways to improve it, of course, make it faster, have more stages of pipeline, have bigger tables. But I think that's basically the right approach for designing a um, sort of an optimized uh, switching, uh, switching chip. And so I do think that this uh, general approach will uh, you know, probably start to be quite, uh, quite commonly adopted. Uh, it's, I, I, it's really interesting what you say about like if you get the if you get the right building blocks and out and and don't worry about the ordering or or how things are composed and just let the software take care of that. I mean that was definitely when we when we built some software on top of your NetFPGA platform, we we took the same approach. Just treat you know basically treat what's on the hardware as, as building blocks and don't make any assumptions about about ordering or or composition. That's right, and you know the 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 the, the, the the job of the architect in this case, the architect of the switching ASIC, is to figure out not how you just put a sea of completely, you know, general purpose building blocks there. Figuring out what the building blocks are, what the interfaces, what the abstractions are to those, and put in exactly that so it can be optimized for very fast hardware in the minimum area and the minimum power. And really, that's what the exercise is. Um, 
and uh, so you know we'll see. Uh, we'll see whether it actually influences anybody at all. That remains to be seen over the next few years. You know the cycles of the you know the, the cycles of hardware are so long. You know once somebody starts designing hardware, it'll be two or three years before any chip ever shows up. And uh, the world you know currently with SDN changing the way it is, the world could look like a very different place. So you know it, it's pretty challenging for any of the uh, existing. Uh, switching chip manufacturers to figure out what to build right now, and so they're understandably uh, trading fairly carefully because it's pretty a pretty expensive mistake to invest in the wrong uh, in the wrong technology. Right, right. All the more reason to just like as you said, make fewer assumptions. Just make sure that you've got the right, the simplest building blocks that are that the, the minimum viable set. I guess. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Um, one thing you mentioned um, when we were talking about uh, just what vendors were doing and, and sort of the trajectory of, of SDN in the next five years or so, you mentioned that, that there are certain domains where you'd expect um, SDN to be showing up more, uh, you know, in, in the WAN and home networks and so forth. And um, certainly the, the the ON Lab has has uh, a project going on the the SDN IP peering stuff, and and uh, also we've been looking a bit at at uh, SDN. Based internet exchange points, and, and yep. therefore, uh -huh. so we talked a little bit about that as well. And I think there might be some stuff going on at Owen Lab that's related to that as well. Um, actually, some some students actually had this question, but I also had the same question, which was, uh, you know, what do you think the the role? Uh, um, what what role do you think SDN has in terms of just reinventing interdomain routing? And do you think that eventually will replace BGP? Do you think that uh, there's going to be some coexistence? Um, and if, if so, what, what do you think are the, the sort of, uh, what, what's the road to, to, uh, to a revolution here, if you will? And, and, and yeah. also, just technically speaking, I guess, but also um, from the perspective of ISPs and content distribution networks and so forth, do you think that there are, I mean, when, when you talked about adoption of SDN, or OpenFlow specifically, you said, you know, basically people started asking for it. So in, in the sense of uh, interdomain routing, what do you think there is going to happen there where ISPs just really start asking for, for saying it, they won't go to an exchange point unless there's SDN enabled. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Maybe, we'll, we'll, see whether that, we'll see whether that happens. But uh, uh, it's a great question. I think it's a great topic and for which I, you know, I think that collectively we've all just scratched the surface so far. Um, I do think that SDN will... The, the, you know, all the WANs, all the public WANs um, will move towards uh, something that is SDN based because it just makes it so much easier to define the, the, you know, the services and the functionality of your network. And if your business, if your livelihood, you know, if you're AT&T or NTT or Verizon, if your livelihood is on not only making networks that work really well, but being able to add new capabilities to that network to differentiate yourself from your competitors and offer services that others can't provide. You want to be able to do that quickly. You want to be able to do that under your control. You want to be able to write the programs. If you're all buying from the same box vendors, the same functionality, the same fixed baked in functionality, you can't differentiate from anybody else and you're buying from people that don't operate networks. So what do they know, right? So by taking control of that, which is really what this is all about, is about taking control. So the anybody that operates a big network and the people that operate the very biggest networks are the network operators themselves, you know, the commercial network public internet service providers. So they have an enormous amount to, to gain from this. On the other hand, they've got an enormous legacy problem, which is, you know, they've got millions and millions of people connected using all sorts of uh, different mechanisms and protocols and and so they've got to try and figure out how to you know, make this all fit in in a nice way with uh, with what works today. So that you know, in some ways, they've got the biggest opportunity, the the biggest you know uh, opportunity to gain from this. But the hardest problem of how to ins in insert that. And so I think there's wonderful, wonderful problems to be solved, um, technically for researchers, academically, from business point of view, in how to bring SDN into into the WAN. And there are a few things that people are starting to do. I think you know experimental SDN exchange points are a great idea. So where there is an exchange point where everybody agrees that you can peer using BGP if you want, but 
if you would rather peer using some other mechanism that is mutually agreed by the parties at the peering point, you can do that too. You could peer at layer two. You could use the peer using MPLS, or you could invent something that was a completely new way to peer. So I think these SDN exchange points will help tease out um, what sorts of opportunities there are, and it'll allow people to experiment with some ideas. So I, I applaud what you've been doing to try and encourage that, and I think it's it's fantastic that these things are starting to to to, to happen. I think we need more work in that area to really try and understand it. There's work that people are doing um, in trying to you know test out ideas with uh, uh, with Internet two. Um, Google has been a little involved with that again to try and tease out what some of these ideas are. And you know I think there's one interesting. Uh, way that SDN could, you know, from a tactical point of view, how it could start to uh, start to be used in the in, in in the WAN, and that is when two entities, two large network entities, uh, come together. They could be two network operators, and they just agree that between them, they're going to peer in some new way. They may say, rather than using BGP, which frankly was, you know, it was conceived of about 20 years ago, and the main reason that it hasn't changed very much is because it's really, really hard to change. Mm -hmm. Not because it doesn't have any problems. We all know it's got many, many problems in, you know, in convergence and the and the way in which express policies and the way you can define, you know, what reaches you, the path that it must have taken in order to reach you. There are so many limitations to it. It can't be that we don't have any see any problems or we don't have any pressing need to change it. It's that we can't. It's really, really hard and it gets bogged down by the vendor controlled sort of standards process. So what we the, what SDM provides is a way for people to experiment with these. So if two companies come together and say, we will peer this way instead, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then to the outside of the union of our two networks, we will peer using BGP. No one else in the rest of the world needs to know or care that we are trying out something new. We'll still peer with everybody else in the same way. We'll just try this out. And then if that works, we'll each go and try and get one other, one other network, and then you sort of get these islands that form. Maybe one island that gets bigger or a number of different islands that work in different ways as people try out different ideas. And then over time, it's sort of, you know... <laughs> like maybe right, like, yeah. Right. What, what you're saying makes a... The core, eat out yeah, the it makes a lot of sense since you... I mean, in, in a lot of cases, you, I mean, if, if you just look at traffic volumes, you have content going straight to eyeballs. So, you know, that might be one place where you might think about just, you know, doing an SDN uh, interstitial layer, if you will, between yeah. these two ISPs. Yeah, yeah. right. And you know, of course, with uh, these 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 two operators don't need to be physically connected to each other. They could be remote, where they're sort of you know tunneling between each other, and then agree that they'll peer over that uh, that sort of logical that logical link. So there's a number of ways in which this could happen. And I think we'll start to we'll start to see see that happen. You know, I have my own ideas, and I know you have your own ideas as to what that peering will be. But frankly, I suspect that again, we'll look back in ten or fifteen years, and it will be. The way in which we'll be using the peering then will be something that we haven't even thought of today, and I think that's what's so exciting about SDN in general is not that any one individual idea can find its path into the network. It's that the collective ideas of all the researchers, all the graduate students, all the open source programmers, all the network engineers can all have a chance as 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 being shown and demonstrated as good ideas as finding a way to influence the network, and it's much easier to change the network to meet the needs of the operators, and so they will want to try these ideas. Probably being a little over uh, optimistic here, but it just I think it will change the game uh, radically, and the best ideas that will be used in networking that SDN will allow to be used are the ideas that we haven't yet thought of. Right. No, I, I actually think it's worth pointing out something, you, I mean, highlighting something you said, which is, which is that, uh, I mean, to, to paraphrase a bit, really you're, you're limited now by, by, by your own imagination uh, because, because so many different things are possible. Uh, I think probably, you know, so, some students today may not remember the, the, the you know, the, the days of networking research where, you know, papers were being rejected based on the fact that things could not be deployed in today's today's internet. Not because yeah. they were bad ideas, but just because there was no hope they'd ever see the light of day. And it seems like that's firmly in the past. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, you know, I should I should say it's only just in the past. Um, right. Probably right. the first, you know, probably the first ten or fifteen SDM papers that people uh, uh, that a number of researchers had, had submitted. For yeah, yeah, yeah. We still on the that. grounds of oh, you know, this requires too much of a change. Right. And uh, but but the great news is that uh, you know that it 
not only is that change happening, but it will allow more change to follow on its heels. And uh, so, yes, I think that that's it's great. It's an absolutely fantastic time to be a networking researcher because there are so many problems that now become approachable, and uh, you can experiment with ideas that you couldn't possibly have thought of uh, before. And you know, we've all seen examples of where you know one graduate student creates a nationwide network with a completely different control paradigm, um, all on their own using, you know, using some kind of experimental infrastructure. It could be Genie, it could be something else, right? Uh, using these sort of SDN ideas. And it's, it's great because you can start, uh, start playing around with these ideas. Yeah, absolutely. I guess one other related point to that that, 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 uh, that I thought of too is that uh, you know, typically we've been a pretty performance-oriented discipline. And uh, now with SDN, of course, there's, there's so many new new things that we can do that, that really talk about, I mean, you talk about um, thinking about ways to make the internet better and there's so many, so many things involving like security and network management and ability to troubleshoot and, and, and so forth that aren't really performance oriented and, and certainly one question I had there is um, in, in some of your own work in these areas like uh, in troubleshooting, for example, your header space analysis work and, and things like that, how do, you, um, how do you convince yourself or how do you convince other people that you have a good solution when it's not just as easy as, you know, this runs 10% faster or, or, or you know, <laughs> consumes 10% less power or what have you. I mean, it's no longer quite so easy to, to convince ourselves that we've got something good, right? Yeah, I think so. But, um, you know, in, in the past, I think you know, we were just a little bit limited in the, the way that we were thinking about it. It was all about net making networks faster. And, you know, that was much needed. Um, during the 1990s, uh, there was a very pressing need for, for to make individual boxes, switches, routers faster and faster, and anything that would squeeze a little bit of extra performance out. Um, you know, clearly with the growth of video, there's still a need for increased uh, performance, but you know, the thing that is so lacking is the flexibility in the way that we control networks, um, the way that we make them reliable, the way that we make them more secure. Uh, and so you know, now the thinking is being towards you know how you control how you manage networks and you know SDN is first and foremost about giving that programmatic control so it's mostly going to be about the sort of the features the use cases the new things that you could do that you couldn't do before and um, you know it's performance is kind of one dimensional this is multi dimensional so on the one hand it's very hard to lay out all the things that you could possibly do but it also tells you that it's a multi dimensional huge field that that will have many many uh, many many new ideas that uh, you know that take on very different very different shapes and so that's wonderful now eventually uh, you know the it, clearly people aren't going to want to use SDN unless uh, you can show that, at the very least, the performance isn't degraded. Um, and, you know, there will be some terrible car crashes that will happen uh, in the early days, I'm sure, where, and we've already seen examples of where, you know, switches were too slow, the way that the CPU controls the switch was too slow, and or controllers that were too slow. But, you know, these are things that, by adopting practices that come from the software community, so, for example, you know, a lot of people still describe SDN as if it's a centralized control plane. Well, I, you know, I think for, for quite a number of years now, we've moved on past that and say, no, no, really what that separation of the control plane from the data plane allows you to choose a distribution model for the state and the control plane independently of the number of boxes you've got in the network. So you now choose your distribution model for the control plane and that, that distributed control plane controls the switches that, that, it needs to, that it needs to switch. But you solve that problem once and then from there you build the applications on top, right? Now, okay, that's great, but now you can adopt all of these techniques in scale-out computing and distributed systems to make that distributed control plane really, really good, really robust, and highly performant. And uh, so now people can steadily work away at improving that. Today with networks, that's almost impossible to do because all the control plane is buried inside the proprietary closed boxes. And so it really makes it possible for these ideas to be applied and for the whole community to work at improving them. So I think that, you know, we're, it's, I'm sure it's behind in terms of performance from the, from the legacy networking approaches, yeah. but it's on this trajectory of where it will just sort of far exceed it in the long term just because it'll allow more people to work on it and bring more ideas and to use these good practices that have been, adopt, have been developed elsewhere. Definitely. Yeah, um, I think it's interesting what you mentioned about, uh, you know, sort of this still, you know, um, 
lingering misconception about the fact that the control plane has to be centralized, um, if you will. And in fact, it, it doesn't, as as you mentioned. And um, one of the thing that one of the things that uh, I wanted to ask you about was um, um, just in terms of, uh, of course, there's been a lot of distributed systems research over the years in terms of uh, you know consistency and so forth. And obviously, like when when we did the RCP and we were talking about like you know distributing. Uh, the you know the, the controller, if you will. Um, yeah. You know, uh -huh. so that was one of the first questions we we grappled with, and and uh, you know we we did a few things there, but it, it seems like um, you know there's been a lot more work in in recent years on 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 consistency models and distributed systems, and I'm wondering it, you know do you think that these two communities or, or or groups of people who are working on distributed systems and and SDN may may benefit in ways. Uh, you know, are there things that we can use from that are going on in, in distributed systems design that, that may make the design of distributed controllers better? Oh, absolutely. I mean, really, you know, SDN. Um, you know, I, I talked at the beginning about the sort of the the aligning of several planets, and this is one of the most important aligning of the planets that happened was the realization that you know networks are just a distributed system. And it's about distributed state management of a large complex system. And so it was when people with enormous amounts of distributed system expertise and skill and experience came into networking that it, that transformation started to, to, to occur. You know, Martin and many of the other people who were sort of very instrumental in the early ideas, they, they were basically coming in with that distributed system mindset and applying it to networking. And so there's a huge amount more, I think, to, to be gained from you know, walking down this path. And I think that's where a huge amount of the innovation will come um, if for, for the control planes. So you know, building a control plane, a, a, sing, a simple, single, centralized control plane is pretty easy. Um, it's making it distributed and uh, you know, applying many of these uh, consistency models and picking the right way to do it, the right, uh, the, you know, uh, whether you have tight consistency at the at the you know, uh, lowest level of control plane above the uh, above the forwarding plane, and then maybe have a slower consistency, like an eventual consistency model higher up. You know, what is the right demarcation between those different consistency models? Um, what's the best way to implement it? What ways actually work in practice? There's you know a lot of academic papers about distributed systems, but um, you know when they're actually applied in practice, many of them fall short. And so there's there's a huge amount of work to be done in distributed systems. It's already being done because of the need for uh, many many other internet applications. So the so I think really there's an enormous amount of low-hanging fruit for people who come in from the distributed systems or are familiar with those techniques and apply them to networking. Very very cool. Um, I wanted to ask like a little bit more about uh, just just research areas in general. I mean, obviously, we just talked uh -huh. about uh, you know distributed systems as being like you know one area where there's there's low hanging fruit. Interdomain routing was another that we that we chatted about. And then uh, I remember a talk that you gave at uh, at the Open Network Summit maybe maybe six months ago where you where you were talking about troubleshooting as as being perhaps one of the um, troubleshooting and debugging of SDNs as being. Uh, uh, sort of another area where there's kind of low hanging fruit. Um, or do you think there, that there are other areas now that, that we should be paying attention to as, as well as, as these? I mean, these are definitely kind of like in our face now, but are, are there others that you think are, I mean, security, for example, comes to mind, like just, you know, just from where I'm coming from, it's like, well, no one's paying attention to that yet, as far as I know. Yeah. But, um, are there, what do you think? I mean, what, are there things where it's just like, wow, no one's paying attention to that, and, and really we should be? I, I mean, I do think that the probably the biggest. Yeah, the security is the the largest topic for which there's a very small amount of attention being being applied right now. I think there's a huge amount of, of you know great research to be done, great exploration to be done uh, in in security for for SDNs. I, going back to one other that you mentioned, which is you know sort of troubleshooting and making making networks work, or how does SDN help us to make networks more reliable, or to troubleshoot them, or to make sure they don't break in the first place? Um, I think is a is a tremendous and a huge opportunity. Um, you know, you know, when I I think that when we when again when we look back in fifteen or twenty years and say, what actually did SDN do for us? What is it that it change about the way that end users perceive the network? And I think it will be that we experience networks as more reliable. They work more of the time. They work better um, uh, by being um, because it will allow. Uh, the the network operators to engineer them better because it gives them more observability of the state in the network, 
and it gives them more controllability of that state to make the network work. And so I think we've, again, we've only just begun. But I think it's really interesting, if you look around at the huge amount of work that's being done in this area, um, you know, at uh, Princeton, at Cornell, at, at Berkeley, at Stanford, a whole bunch of different schools, and your work, and then Brighton's work at the, the Urbana Champaign, the, the, uh, the, there's an immense amount of work going on amongst the schools and amongst the people who have sort of been thinking about these ideas for the longest. And so I think that tells us something that there's just an immense amount of research ideas there. And so for someone looking for, you know, interesting research topic, I think that there are going to be whole workshops and conferences that are about making network, formally verifying networks, testing and debugging networks, trying to figure out when networks go wrong, what caused that problem. And really, in, in, in traditional networks, you know, the... Uh, the, the state in the network is carried in the forwarding entries and the switches and the routers, which was put there by all sorts of different reasons. It was put there by protocols, it was put by local configuration, it was put there by scripts, um, it was put there for all sorts of reasons. The state is a complete mess. It was many, many individual entities writing it, um, and you know the only tools that we have available to us are things like ping and traceroute. And what are we doing? We're trying to figure out what that state is and why it got there by sort of trying to pattern match with things we've seen in the past. With oh yeah, that's a kind of an error that I saw ten years ago. It's not telling us what is the state, what wrote that state, and why, and is the reason that it's there consistent with our original intention for the for the network. So now in the SDN model, the intent is encoded in the application at the top that writes to the control plane what it wants the network to do, which writes to the forwarding plane how it should forward packets. So there is all the, all the state control and configuration goes down. Everything that we see in the forwarding plane should be there for a purpose that was determined by the control plane and an application sitting on top of it. So now we can look at that forwarding state and we can compare it with the original intent and say, is it consistent? This is totally unlike the way that networks have worked in the exactly. past. Exactly. Yeah, you have a you have a way of explaining what's there. If you yeah. Will. For every and piece so of state, you can you can trace it to an action that put it there. Uh, that's right. That's right. And yeah, you know, that's not an easy thing to do uh, to figure out why it's there. You can figure out that it's wrong, but then figure out why which piece of code actually put it there in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so there's some great work that started to be done in this area. I just think that it's just a phenomenal amount of work. So. In, you know, in terms of the different pieces of research, sort of, you know, interesting research questions, I think this is just a an elephant in the room. Right? It's just a monstrous piece of work to to to, to be working on. So, you know, um, I've had several PhD students working on it recently. There are many PhD students around the country and around the world that are working on it. And I continue, you know, I'm going to continue working on that for a while. And it it is a wonderfully academic problem. It has wonderful intellectual properties to it, and the you know the sort of rigor to it and formality. And it has a wonderful application because now SDN provides a way to transfer this idea to the people that operate networks. So you know it has the whole gamut of being really, really interesting sort of uh, field. Just don't tell anyone because you know obviously we want to keep all the good research ideas to ourselves. That's right. We'll, right. we'll tell, yeah. we'll anyway. tell the thousands of people in the Coursera course yeah. to. Uh, no, that's fantastic. Quickly the more lose the interest in this and yeah, cover the your more, ears. Yeah. The more the merrier because the more people that work on these problems. Uh, the more interesting it gets, the more ideas that we'll get to improve the practice, and in the end, that's what that's what really needs to to have happen. I think in other areas of you know other uh, sort of um, big areas of uh, research are likely to be uses of SDN in contexts or types of network where it hasn't been applied so far. Uh, you and I have both talked in the past about home networking, you know, the essentially the outsource of control yeah. from the home. Um, to relieve the burden of home, you know, home, uh, uh, homeowners from having to manage and control and configure their own network to make it somebody else's problem. And as soon as you make it somebody else's problem, they can not only make your home network potentially better, they can potentially uh, sort of add new, more services and more capabilities into your home. So, for example, you know, most of what I do in the home is either read email, surf the web, or, or watch videos. Uh, over time, probably most of that traffic will be for video. Well, how do I optimize the network at home for video? How, under my control is my choice by telling somebody else who is a third party that that's what I want to have happen and then making my network better. And, uh, you know, there are, all, there are all sorts of things like this where we can make home networks uh, much better by that sort of um, separation of the control from the from the forwarding. Um, I think that uh, there will be other applications in sort of coordination of, of Wi-Fi over, over 
you know, neighborhoods of uh, the blending or the merging of cellular and, and Wi-Fi, the sharing of different cellular physical infrastructure by different providers um, by making it a software problem rather than a hardware problem um, and uh, sort of logically separating the, 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 the control from the data plane, allowing many um, companies that are controlling and managing and who have have their own subscribers sharing a physical network because you've separated the separated the two. Um, so I think that you know those different applying SDN to these different uh, contexts will be really really yeah really very fruitful. That, yeah, it seems like there's there's just a ton of opportunities uh, um, just in many different areas as as we were as as we've been saying all all throughout the, yeah. the hour. Um, the green field. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's that's actually a pretty good place to, to wrap up. But but actually, I did have one final question which I wanted to weave in, which uh, just because it um, it's something that in, in in the process of teaching the course, um, we did a lot of work with with Mininet. Uh -huh. um, and oops, still there. <laughs> That will happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think we need SDN to, to sort of improve reliability. Yeah, <laughs> um, we did a lot of work with. We've done a lot of work with Mininet. Uh -huh. and, um, one of the things that really opened my eyes uh, about Mininet is um, is uh, uh, that we can basically completely emulate the network, right? And then we can have um, students or researchers or, or developers or operators build their own um, control uh, platform. Right or a control program, and then that's the actual binary that might run in a real network. So yeah. previously we had had a hard time convincing ourselves, like, okay, well we've got this emulation in Emulab or a simulator or what have you, and how do we convince ourselves that that's going to really work? Well, we actually have no idea because if we take the simulated BGP and then drop it in in a real network, like, who knows yeah. what's going to happen? Yeah. But with, with Mininet, I think one of the most beautiful things about it is like you've got real code running there. That's your real control code, and then um, you just slide your emulated network out, and you slide a real network in, and, and then and then you're good. <laughs> yep. Um, and um, you know, just in working with it, um, uh, you know, as I've learned more about it, I, I think that's one of the most beautiful things about it. Um, but uh, one of the things I wanted to ask that's, that's definitely relevant in the context of what we've talked about with interdomain routing is meaning that's still limited to like emulation and uh, on a single laptop. It's really very much like um, you know single network emulation, and also mm -hmm. Um, doesn't really have any wide area elements. Like, doesn't really, you know, talk about emulation at at, at uh, you know gl global scale, if you will. Um, but um, certainly, one of the things uh, that I wanted to, to to ask you about, just you know, in terms of the you know future of of, of SDN, Mininet, the directions in interdomain routing, is do you think it's possible to extend that that kind of emulation environment for emulating wide area internet interdomain routing scenarios and uh, you know, it, it, if so, you know, do you think it's a good idea? Do you think it's possible? Like, uh, you know, what, what, uh, what are your thoughts there? I think it's a great question. Um, you know, if, when um, when Bob Lance and Brandon Heller first came up with the idea of Mininet based on you know the the uh, uh, lightweight virtualization um, that's uh, built into to, to Linux, you know, to start with, just you know the the, the sort of simple container mechanism seemed like a um, uh, just a good way to do exactly what you're saying, which is you know you develop your code for the control plane and then you just move it seamlessly into the network. And you know a lot of the early efforts were just seeing whether that was true or not. And and uh, we and others did a number of different uh, sort of experiments, uh, sort of just validating that that was in fact the case. And and then you know we began to realize that this was this this potentially would be a lot more powerful uh, pow powerful uh, approach. For example, if you're doing emulation. The, the, the basic Mininet provides you with essentially a functional verification, uh, testing whether the features are correct, but it doesn't tell you anything about the performance or the speed. Um, and so we started to think about um, how you would uh, do, you know, emulation up to a point, but that you know, limited by what you can what you can emulate on a laptop with a laptop CPU. But within that within that constraint, can you can you emulate the performance characteristics of a network as well? And uh, so we started to see that, yeah, there seems to be a lot of promising, sort of promising ideas there. And uh, you know, we've been using it to sort of reproduce experiments that were done on real networks and test and compare them to see whether the performance matches. And you know, in many cases, it actually does does quite quite well. 
And then there's other directions. You can say, well, what if I want to do a bigger network? Now I need to actually put this over multiple uh, multiple laptops or multiple servers. You know, just having it on a single server is convenient, but clearly much more uh, scalable if we can put it on multiple. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so there's there is work that uh, the the we've been doing and it's going on at uh, the Open Networking Lab, but I think other people are working on this as well. Is to how you how you you know essentially do a cluster edition of of Mininet. That's exactly. Like exactly. And uh, so I think that will that will definitely happen. Over the over the coming over the coming months, um, you're asking a slightly different question though, which I think is a really interesting one. Beyond just having scaling Mininet itself, so you can emulate larger networks. What if you are emulating networks that have completely different address spaces or address spaces that correspond to different domains? Now the you know the the namespace abstraction within uh, Linux is very nice in that it allows you to have that control over the over the address space. So in principle, it should be possible, but um, Hey, this is a great project. This is a great project for someone to take on and figure out exactly how to how to work. I, I don't see any technical roadblocks to, to, to doing that, uh, but the the devil will be in the details. So I think it would be a great thing to do. You know, I think the the ability to be able to test out new interdomain routing mechanisms prior to anyone trying them in, say, one of these new exchange points, SDN exchange points, yeah. will be phenomenally valuable. I think it would be really, really useful. So, uh, yeah. I, I hope it happens. <laughs> yeah, no, it's something something to work on. I suppose, like uh, you know, the the Owen Lab is doing stuff in this area, and and, and we are too, and uh, you know, um, you know, the group at Princeton and so forth. I, I think now we've got a lot of uh, a lot of uh, fuel to go uh, to to go light some fires in this area. So you know, one thing that I've started seeing happening in networking, and this reminds me of it, just in the last few years, is that the, the, there's a sort of a sea change in the way that we all approach research, and that's the much, much more sharing of building blocks. No, no, not building blocks like a bit of a simulator. They're building blocks that are bits of networks and bits of network infrastructure that are represented in software. And sort of all building off each other and all exchanging stuff and uh, testing and reproducing each other's ideas or, or then then uh, sort of building on top of something that someone else has created. You can test it in you know, something like Mininet or an actual SDN network and see that it functions correctly and then say, okay, I'll trust that now and I'll build on top of it. So this is how systems research is supposed to be. It's never really been like that in networking before. So it's it's pretty encouraging. Exactly. I mean it's it's super awesome. I mean even even in the in the in the context of the course and I think that it's it's a huge tribute to the to the Mininet designers, right? I mean you'd never imagine that we would be having thousands of people uh, basically running their own version of the same network. Uh, and then not only not only that, but what you said is exactly right. I mean, we've had them basically start with Mininet, but then build up Pox, like build you know use Pyretic on top of that, and then we've had them Fantastic. build Resonance on top of that. So, you know, uh, doing that in a small classroom, let alone on a large scale, is not something I think we would have dreamed would be happening five years ago. So it's it's really really exciting. So networking is coming to the twenty first century. That's great. At, at last. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, only 13 years late, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, um, thanks a lot. Uh, definitely uh, l let you go, and uh, really, really appreciate your time. It's been been quite a long, long chat, but uh, lots of stuff to talk about. So, so really, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Nick. I really enjoyed it, and I think it's fantastic that you're doing this 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 class because you know building a larger ecosystem, more people, the opportunity to be a part of uh, sort of part of this change is fantastic. So, uh, I take my hat off to you for doing this. Thanks a lot.